Okay, I want to ask something because I feel like I'm in a place that's similar to a lot of people where I've been a part of a tradition that basically allows every individual to go in his office um, or his basement and just kind of come up with an interpretation and then get as many followers as they can. And so it's almost a popularity contest, right? Of, hey, I am so intelligent, so follow me. Or I have this supernatural power and doing these miracles, so follow me. Or I just have a charismatic personality, or I'm just a gifted leader. And so, and, and, and based upon that, you have so many different theologies that when you walk into a church, you don't know their view of sexuality, you don't know their view of marriage and divorce, you don't, it's just, because everyone just preaches something different. And so some of us are just going, okay, I've been a part of that. It feels like a circus, you know, and I am fighting for these things. And now I'm seeing some of the wisdom of, okay, I get why people say, wait, you don't just everyone goes alone and figures it out for themselves and then gathers as many followers as possible. We go back to the ancient church and try to figure out what did those early church fathers agree on? What did those councils agree on? And part of that feels very good to me that it's not like I've got to be that beacon of truth because everyone and their mother is starting their own podcast, you know, out of their basement and going, hey, follow me. These guys are out. These guys are out. You know, and 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 it's just going, this is ridiculous. This can't be the way. And so there's something attractive going, oh, there was a time when everyone agreed. I want to go back to that so that I can say, look, this isn't an idea that I just made up. 1,500 years, they all agreed, this is your view of sexuality. This is the view of whatever, whether it's a Eucharist, how you dress or whatever. But I'm just going, gosh, I don't know if I, I, I want to surrender to that. There's a part of me that would go, oh, that would be nice. Um, I don't have to feel like I'm the savior of the world and my theology is right and I got to fight all these other guys who think their theology is right. I'd like to be able to say, you know, what I believe is historical. This is what everyone believed uh, for this many years. Um, now, again, I don't know what to do at this point. I'm not where you guys are at, where you've tied yourself completely. Um, and I, I guess I feel a little bit lost like I'm starting to see the value in that. I mean, really see the value in that and see that make sense. And going, gosh, that does make more sense than being out here rebellious. I feel a bit arrogant for the way I've lived my life and the way that I've taught because it had a lot to do with me and my personal interpretation. And I do want to learn what is, you know, this collective interpretation they talk about in these councils. What would be your advice to me in taking this next step. Yes, I also uh, saw the news clip of this uh, influential and dynamic Protestant pastor asking this question. And also I read some of the responses from some of his, uh, his uh, parishioners, uh, some of his uh, flock to his queries. You know, when, you're, uh, when your faith is built upon uh, the articulation of a faith that didn't exist uh, prior to the 16th century, it can be very unnerving to begin to ask the question, uh, what did the believers believe before the 16th century? Uh, I ask often in, in correspondence with inquirers here in my own parish, uh, we, I've been able to, to catechize and, and baptize hundreds of Protestant Christians over the years. Uh, and one of the questions I ask them is, if, if they can't take their faith, what they believe now in the 21st century as Protestant Christians, in the 18th century, or in the 13th century, or in the 9th century, or in the 3rd century, if they can't find their faith there, uh, if they could transport themselves to a previous time, uh, and they couldn't actually find a church to go to because there was no com Christian community that was articulating their faith, uh, then that is one of the clearest signs that they are not 
in the church of Jesus Christ, because the church that Jesus Christ established was 2000 years ago, and he made precious promises to the church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. And he promised to send the Holy Spirit to his disciples to lead them into all of the truth. So as soon as, a, as soon as a Protestant Christian begins to read church history prior to the 16th century, this raises many important questions. One of the important questions then uh, is what the Protestant Christian thinks about those believers who clearly were not Protestant. And as, as they begin to wade into the ocean of sacred literature from the first 15 centuries, they begin to see commonalities as this pastor himself has seen. And one of those commonalities uh, in the first 1100 years of the church, for instance, when the East and West were undivided, was that all Christian believers confessed the Nicene Creed. All Christian believers had an altar that was the center of their worship life. They all had a bishop uh, and a priest appointed by him to be a shepherd of their souls. And they all received the Eucharist as the climax of their worship experience and of their connection with God. Uh, so if you're in a Protestant communion, communion that doesn't have a bishop, it doesn't have an altar, it doesn't have the sacred gifts, uh, the precious sacrament of the Eucharist at the center, uh, then that would naturally lead to questions of uh, uh, what, it, what happened? How did we get to be where we are today? Uh, and the thing to do, the piece of advice I would simply say to this pastor and to all Protestants who are inquiring is to continue to search. Uh, I myself, when I began to first explore holy orthodoxy as a young man, uh, I was encouraged uh, to pay attention, especially to literature that was written by authors who have uh, ST period or agios, right, in front of their name. Yeah. Uh, because this, this is a completely different type of, of literature. This is a this is an authentic and authoritative account of lived experience with Christ uh, that comes from the saints. And it has a certain potency. It has a, a power, a spiritual vitality uh, that uh, changes you. You know, one of our recent uh, incredible uh, saints, uh, Elder Emilianos of Simenopet from Monastery, he, he has a chapter in one of his books on the, the value of spiritual study of reading the lives of the saints and of the, of the scriptures, which are in harmony. And he says to do so, to, to touch the pages of, of the scripture, for instance, is like touching the clothing of Jesus. And you, you know, it produces a, an effect upon you uh, in, in consonance with the Holy Spirit. And the more that Protestants begin to uh, dive into uh, the literature of the saints and to read the Bible in the context of the historic church, uh, things begin to settle and become clear.